Oh. Hi, Peter. Hey. Hi, hi, how are you? Very, very well. Uh, I am uh, Will Wilkinson here at the Cato Institute. Uh, thank you for coming on Free Will. You are Peter Moskos, uh, author of the book Cop in the Hood, My Year Policing Baltimore's Eastern District. Um, Peter, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a, a professor now. Where are you at? I am a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. And uh, I was a cop for just under two years for uh, 20 months altogether in Baltimore from, uh, uh, from late 1999 to uh, middle of 2001. And this book is uh, sort of a, your recounting of your time uh, in Baltimore uh, as a police officer. Uh, you, you, obviously, you were an academic, uh, so how is it that you came to uh, get into policing? Why did you end up in Baltimore? Um, Tell us a little bit about how the project uh, started and, you know, why why it is that you were interested in this topic. Right. Uh, those are good questions. Uh, I was in graduate school in sociology at Harvard University, and I started there in 1995. And I think like many uh, sociology majors, I was majoring in sociology primarily because I had no idea what I wanted to do. <laughs> and it's a very uh, forgiving field, or it can be a very forgiving field. Uh, but I've always... Uh, I've always loved cities. I've always been a city boy, and I knew it, I wanted something urban-related. About the same time, uh, that was the start of the big crime drop in, well, not that it was the middle of the big crime drop in New York City, but it was just starting to get sort of press as people took it seriously mm -hmm. and said, wow, crime's going down. And for decades, the academic world said that police could not do anything to reduce mm -hmm. crime, and that was just the party line. And then crime started going down, and academics said, oh, it's not really going down. It won't continue to go down. It's it, and, and they were basically wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed this and said, well, the whole field is wrong. I mean, that, that's a good field to get into. Yeah. Uh, so I proposed a uh, research plan, uh, which was largely based on uh, what John Van Manen, he's a professor at MIT now, but he uh, went through the Seattle Police Academy around in the early 70s, and um, I kind of wanted to do that 30 years later and see, or I guess, you know, 25 mm -hmm. years later and see uh, how things have changed. Baltimore said I could. I could. Uh, you know, New York wouldn't return my phone calls because that was still under Giuliani. Yeah. Uh, Boston said no. Um, Baltimore, to their credit, said, yeah, you can come here and you know, do whatever you're going to do and, and, and write about it. Yeah. So I went down to Baltimore and... Uh, on day two of the police academy, I, w I was pulled out of some mindless... Uh, marching military formation and told that I could not continue my research. Uh, the old commissioner, Thomas Frazier, who I never met, but mm -hmm. he approved my plan. He was out. The uh, new acting commissioner hated the old commissioner, um, <laughs> and there were just departmental politics yeah. I knew nothing about. So my plan was, was vetoed at ex post facto, but I had this very awkward and unpleasant meeting with the acting commissioner at the time, and he said, well, I think he was surprised I was even there. He just, But, um, he, uh, he said, well, why don't you become a cop for real? And I said, well, who's going to hire me knowing that I'm going to quit after a year? Though I ended up staying too, but I'm going to quit after a year and write a book about it. Yeah. And he said, well, if you can get hired, I'll hire you. Uh, so I don't really view this man as my friend, and yet he, that was an incredible opportunity. Yeah. And it turned out uh, well for me. So I, I did get hired, went through the hiring process and got hired. Um, and then... Uh, Worked. Uh, I got assigned to the Eastern District, where I uh, worked. I was there for uh, 14 months, I guess. I, I, I quit when I got civil service protection. Once, once they couldn't fire me, I felt that was a good time to quit. And then <laughs> I went back to uh, went back to school, and uh, things were pretty slowly in academia. But I, I, I finished my dissertation in 2004, and I've been at John Jay College ever since. And my, my book's out now. Uh, outstanding. So I, I, I guess I, the Eastern District of Baltimore is not um, paradise um, by by any means. In fact, it's one of the uh, your book. I mean, you couldn't have planned it to have a certain kind of currency. Uh, the television show The Wire has been incredibly popular. So uh, probably I should get this out of the way. Uh, how good is The Wire? Uh, I love The Wire. Mm -hmm. uh, that was filmed when and where I was working. Mm -hmm. uh, season one, I think, started in 2002, but it was filmed when I was there. So we knew something was going on, and I had seen The Corner and things preceding yeah. that. Uh, the Wire is, from a police perspective, um, I'd say it's about 80% realistic. Mm -hmm. And um, 
It's not 100% by any means, yeah. but it is so much more realistic than any other police TV show or movie ever made. Um, and that's and probably to the credit of Ed Burns, who actually was a cop, right? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's all the writers. It's him, it's yeah. Pat they, they get the. They, they really do understand um, the local dialect. I mean, certainly Ed Burns is a police officer. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's... You, that from a police perspective, you can't beat that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I'd, I'd love it if one of the uh, writers had been a had been a drug dealer, because I, from a police <laughs> perspective, the drug dealing looks realistic. But I don't know from the other side yeah. how that would be. Yeah. Um, so what's so the twenty percent uh, they got wrong? The twenty percent they got wrong. Um, ironically, believe it or not, if you watch the wire, sometimes they, sh- they show the offices are a little nicer in the wire than they often are in uh, real life. That The court system, believe it or not, functions better at times in the wire. Um, the things that I find aren't police-related maybe tend to be a little more, a little more glossed over. Uh, mm-hmm. But those are minor. Uh, the, the one that jumps to mind is, uh, is Hamsterdam, the, um, the, the, yeah. their sort of drug-free zone that I guess that was season three, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is just... And the part that is unrealistic ab- about that is um, there's just no way f- not not even for one day but even in the planning stages that something like that could remain secret the, the, the grapevine in the police department is so porous that um, they would have known about that from before moment one and you know put their foot down right yeah. away um, I, I, I actually I asked uh, George Pelicanos who was mm-hmm. kind enough to write a blurb for my book I was complaining to him about that um, and yeah. complimenting him on all the uh, the Greek characters and he said you can pretty much assure everything Greek that's me um, <laughs> but he yeah. said look it, it is a fiction show we wanted to be realistic yeah. but you know there are debates about we had to debate about that because we knew it couldn't happen but that's a sacrifice yeah. to make you know for our art so you know and probably you couldn't get away that. with uh, you know like a rigging up a bunch of uh, fake serial killings and uh, keeping that a secret either could you? Well, if you lock them in, in, if you board them up like that and they don't decompose, I don't see why not to no. some extent. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Well, I don't want to make this uh, about the why. I want to talk about your book, but uh, uh, you're at least but, someone but it, who it can is speak to the veracity of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, certainly good. I mean, I, I do love The Wire, but it's certainly, you know, I, I proposed to my editor we call my book The Wire Season 6. This time it's real. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a great show, and I'll be happy to take any, uh, I'll be happy to hang on any coattails I can based on it. So, uh, tell me, you, now you're a Harvard... Uh, graduate student in sociology, uh, that's not the typical background for somebody in the police academy uh, who's going to serve in the uh, department in Baltimore. Uh, how were you received by the uh, the other police officers there, and what did they think of your project? I mean, you had to seem kind of like egg-headed to them, I imagine. I, I'm sure I was. Uh, I... What I found interesting was, I mean, on, on day one of the academy, I, I announced, uh, you know, I, I, all my research was over it. I wasn't trying to hide anything mm-hmm. from the police department, which worried me in the beginning, but in, in hindsight, that was the, the best thing I ever could have done, and mm-hmm. for academic reasons, I had to do that as right. well. But um, I got very little flack from the police officers or police department. Mm-hmm. Um, ironically, I found I was more accepted by cops for being a Harvard grad student than I was uh, by Harvard professors for being a Baltimore cop. Hmm. Um, I, I had That's more problem from, from the academic side than the police side. So what was the beef with the uh, academic side? Why, why, why did they give you problems? Well, it's certainly atypical. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, academically, there are issues about objectivity and, mm-hmm. and things that perhaps I should take more seriously than I do. Um, but also when I went down there, I think uh, I just switched advisor. I think he felt that I was pulling the bait and switch on him. And deep down, I always wanted to become a police officer, which mm. wasn't the case. But I also think some of it, I, I really think it was just a sort of class snobbery that this, uh, that if Ivy League students aren't supposed to become police officers. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a working class job. And I mean, maybe that's not it, but that's kind of the sense I got. Uh, where on the flip side from police officers, where I was expecting to have more resentment, uh, because of the fact I could, you know, go to these schools, um, the attitude I heard, and it was the same line I heard from more than one person, but if you're using this as a stepping stone to something better, more power to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found from the cop perspective, uh, as long as you do your job, as long as you're not an asshole, 
um, and ideally you go out after work and drink with them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's you know, that's all they care about. If you're personable and you do your job. Look, a lot of cops, maybe it wasn't what I wanted to do, but a lot of cops wanted to do other things as well, whether it was mm-hmm. get a job in a different agency or, you know, get a master's degree somewhere. Um, so the, the idea that this wasn't my life calling, um, so, some cops, I think, you know, maybe never took me seriously because mm-hmm. it wasn't my calling, but others said, fine, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a job for us too, you know, and you use it for what you can. So what's the, what's the profile of a... Uh, a typical, uh, you know, big city police officer like in Baltimore, uh, like, 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 what's the? Do you have, a, you know, a good idea about the sort of average level of education, the sort of demographic mix of the police department, things like that? Yeah, I mean, the education levels are relatively Baltimore, relatively low. Baltimore doesn't have uh, any college requirements for police officers, so it's mostly high school graduates. Uh, who are police officers. That being said, I mean, many of them are, are, are very smart, so it's not mm-hmm. a question of intelligence. But the edu- it, it, it's, it's a working-class, blue-collar job, by and large. Um, there's a pretty... Um, split maybe is too strong of a word, but, well, maybe not. I mean, there, there, there's somewhat of a racial split where a lot of the white officers come from the county, the surrounding areas, mm-hmm. or more rural parts of Maryland, yeah. where uh, black officers are more likely to have some experience or be from Baltimore City itself. Uh, so there's some sort of cultural differences there that um, that don't, I mean, that, that, are, that are always present, but then, you know, they're present everywhere in American society. Um, I found that my police academy class was uh, the most diverse class that I've ever been in. Um, mm-hmm. Except, you know, maybe since high school gym, or maybe now that I teach at John Jay, which is also a very diverse yeah. school. But real diversity. Um, not just, you know, people of similar back- backgrounds but different skin colors, but people with, you know, many different experiences. And, and in that sense, um, as an academic, well, just as a human being, I mean, I thought it was fascinating to just, mm-hmm. you know, be in the same room with all these people. I mean, that, that fascination wears off when you're in the same room for six months. But, uh, but, but in that sense, it, it's, it's, a, it's a broad mix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I should I, I should say like I'm, it's a completely different thing, I guess. Uh, my dad was a police officer. He was the chief of police in the uh, town that I grew up in, which was uh, Marshalltown, Iowa. And then he was after that the chief of police in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And uh, Marshalltown and Council Bluffs, though, uh, you know, I don't know. They are to Baltimore, you know, what you know Denmark is to. Iraq or something, so 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 there's probably a, a rather different kind of police work, and then he was you know kind of the management. Um, but I grew up around you know summer softball games uh, where you know with the cops playing the firemen and things like that. You know, yeah, we unfortunately there was no softball. There was, there was no softball team. The, uh, <laughs> the nature of, of rotating shifts kind of kills that. But but um, one one of my my friends who I, I worked with, he um, with. 33 years of experience on he had and he was wonderfully not burnt out by the whole process mm-hmm. but he, I, I think he, he defined my attitude towards policing pretty well when he said uh, as I was you know right when I was at the tail end he said you know you just you might not have the I don't see the fire in your belly to be a cop which I think is true I mean it, it mm-hmm. wasn't my life's calling but he, he said you like the camaraderie and the drinking and the steamed crabs and, and that <laughs> part of it is true um, I mean as a job it, it, it shares a lot of drudgery I think you might get with any blue collar job of mm-hmm. just sort of punching the clock and, and working for a dysfunctional organization and, and though at any moment it's not a very repetitive job in the sense anything can happen but day after day after day um, working in the eastern district it is pretty repetitive I mean, you know, you're clearing the same people off the same corners every day and, and I mean you know, the, there's not that much difference between one shooting and the next shooting yeah. I mean there's always the, the fear you know there's always the, the chance that of real danger and, and, and injury and you want to avoid that but I even felt that I mean just after a year when I, there started people being people uh, younger than me in my squad uh, the learning curve sort of dropped off and that's part of the mm-hmm. reason I, I quit when I did as well well so tell me about a, 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 t- a typical day so it's it, uh, you you know you show up at whatever the sort of precinct yeah, well, well, was at 11 th- th- yeah yeah, it was at 11.39. Uh, um, now I think it's all the shifts have moved up an hour But uh, mm-hmm. for the midnight shift. The midnight shift I was assigned to, but I've, I've always been a night owl, so um, I was quite happy on the midnight shift because it meant I never had to get up at 6 a.m. Um, the, and uh, the other shifts rotate, and the midnight shift is permanent. So even in the police role, there's mm-hmm. a little bit of a... 
people wonder what goes on in a midnight shift. Um, and partly I was worried of, you know, going to Baltimore and then going to the Eastern District and then going to the midnight sh- shift. I mean, I, I felt very much that, um, you know, that it, it was sort of a trip into the heart yeah. of darkness. But, also, but, you know, but it's it's they're good people and they're doing their job. And it, to some extent, police is a lot less exciting. There's certainly a lot less corruption and, and brutality and things that people perceive. I mean, it's, it's a bunch of guys doing their job and, and, you know, they don't want to mess it up and they're waiting for their pension. But mm-hmm. the, in, in the day-to-day work, you go, you go to roll call, um, you head out on the, you know, then after roll call, uh, you get in your car, you, there's shift change, the, the previous shift is called in, which is a brief moment that there's really nobody policing the streets. Uh, you get in your car, you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you get coffee. Um, I wasn't too big on the donuts, but you'd start with the coffee and. Um, do cops really eat a lot of donuts? No, but they do drink a lot of coffee, mm-hmm. and uh, so you, there there was a Dunkin' Donuts rush every shift change. But uh, now I don't think they eat more donuts than other people. But um, the coffee definitely. Uh, and on the midnight shift, you start by you sort of usually it depends. There might be a bunch of calls backed up from shift chains, so you sort of mm-hmm. answer those. But you, you kind of drive around. Um, you see who's hanging out in the corners. You tell them to leave the corners. Uh, you, you go to the you know to the drug dealers and tell them to get off the corners. Um, and you answer radio calls. Uh, it, there is a sort of routine to it. Um, that's, I mean, as there is to any job. But so it becomes, it, it's almost ritualized, sort of the behavior uh, between police officers and drug dealers hanging out in the corner, mm-hmm. where, you, where you pull up and. Ideally, they just walk away and they go around the block and you leave and they come back. And if you get tired of that, you tell them to, you know, if they come back, you lock them up. But it's kind of a cat and mouse game. Mm-hmm. Um, in Baltimore, I mean, then, you know, there, every couple of nights there'd be a bad cutting or a shooting and you, you deal with that, um, which it, you're picking, you're doing a lot of picking up the pieces after the fact. So even, you know, you say, oh, yeah, you know, a guy got shot, you know, four times. Um, Usually, not always, but usually when you, by the time you get there as a police officer, it's all done. So, yeah. um, so I mean, was it really quite typical for you where you were to uh, have calls to murder scenes? Yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I was the primary officer on a murder call when I was still in field training, like two weeks out of the <laughs> academy. Um, the, the, the level of violence did shock me uh, in well, every You know, every city's got... Ghetto. So I want part of the part of what I worry about my book because I do love Baltimore and I think it's a it's a great city. Um, it, it means well, as as I say. But uh, Baltimore's just got more ghetto, and the ghetto it has is probably a little bit worse than a lot of cities. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a level of violence that that is really amazing because it's not just the murders. It's 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 the it's all that for every murder there's probably another two or three people who were shot and didn't die. Right. Um, they don't make the papers. I mean, you never hear about it. So. Unless you live in that neighborhood, um, unless you have a personal connection to the victim, or unless you're a police officer, it really is like it never happened. Uh, these because it's happening to people that, mm-hmm. I mean, it's happening to people involved in the drug trade, but people that uh, that the outside world doesn't care about. Uh, so I was a bit shocked at, at the, the level of violence. One of the, the sort of few stats in my book, and I did a little research, and maybe I'll be proven wrong, but I, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell, it's accurate. Um, Based on homicide rate, based on census data, uh, the if you are born a man in East Baltimore, which means you're born a black man, mm-hmm. uh, there is a 13 percent chance you're going to get murdered in your lifetime. That's um, just, just based incredible. on the numbers. Yeah. And even if the numbers are a little off, I mean, I don't know what would be good. Is is, is 7 percent acceptable? I mean, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, no. <laughs> it is a it's a level of mortality that that's really shocking. And then if you add to that drug overdoses. Um, there are just a lot of people dying. Yeah, and no, that's just completely terrifying. Uh, the uh, so t- tell me something. Well, let, let's get to the uh, to some of the the side effects and the incentives of uh, drug dealing and the drug war. But before that, uh, I just just this talk of all the all the all the violence and the shootings um, uh, makes me think of uh, issues about gun control. Uh, do you think that like more uh, gun control, stricter 
gun control or like prohibition of weapons would make any difference at all in a place like Baltimore, or is it basically everybody yeah, exactly who's getting, or in, in the real world? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> if the theory is about the real world, I suppose in the real world. Uh, I mean, or is it already? I don't know what's the law. Is it legal to own a handgun in Baltimore? Well, compared to, uh, I mean, uh, it's not banned. Um, it's not banned. Uh, well, you know, I don't know. I was a cop, so I wasn't paying attention. I had a gun. Uh, <laughs> there are, you see more store owners carrying unconcealed guns. It, it's looser than you would get in a northern state and probably stricter than you get in a state further south. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I, you do go walk into the auto parts store and, you know, the sales clerk woman has a gun on her strapped to her hip. I mean, I, that was a bit of a shock to me to see that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I... I mean, to, you know, the cops I worked with uh, were pretty conservative uh, yeah. socially and politically, um, and I have always been a sort of open liberal, which, you know, gave them lots of chances to make fun of me and blame <laughs> me for all the problems of the ghetto. Um, it was either my fault or, or Hillary Clinton's fault. Those are, but um, <laughs> I, if I could wave a magic wand, I, um, and I can already hear cops wincing, I, I would love to ban handguns. Mm -hmm. Um, In the ideal world, I am not a fan of guns. I think societies without guns are safer. Um, There are societies with guns that are safe. America is unique in that we have guns in poverty. Um, I think there are not many countries that have both those those variables. There's Um, lots of guns in Switzerland, but not a lot of uh, shootings in the uh, Swiss ghettos. Yeah, guns in Switzerland. (laughs) Um, There are lots of guns in in Greece, uh, which for a long time was a poor country, um, but they didn't have a culture of killing each other. Yeah. And, and there's then perhaps have the abject poverty. And, uh, yeah. Um, so that being said, I, 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 I'm not a fan of guns, but one thing I think that changed in me policing in Baltimore, especially policing New Year's Eve when everyone shoots off their guns, you realize just how outgunned you are and how many guns are in Baltimore. And I think it is, um, it's impossible, I think, for, for gun control to work. And in that sense, I wouldn't want to waste political capital doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, and I, I'm no fan of the National Rifle Association, but mm-hmm. one thing they say that makes sense is, look, every gun used in a crime in Baltimore is already illegal. It's possessed illegal, illegally, it's used illegally. Um, people who use guns do not have licenses for these guns. Mm-hmm. So we can pass all the gun control we want and all the feel-good laws we want, it, it doesn't work. We do have to. I mean, we have, they're already illegal. What, what else can we do? Um, we've passed the laws. The problem is there. There are just so many guns in America, um, and not. And, and I mean, about gun control, the problem, which I think a lot of a lot of uh, anti-gun liberals don't understand, is in, in the same way we love the First Amendment and don't want any compromises on free speech. People associate guns with freedom, and you can debate about what the Second mm-hmm. Amendment means. But for a lot of people, it means freedom, and they're gonna. They're not going to give up their guns without a fight, and, yeah. and I'm not willing to make that fight. I've always found there to be, and it's interesting, and, and I think I've actually come closer to this. It's not a, it's not an intellectual position. It's more of a, an attitude towards firearms that in a lot of, uh, especially sort of northeast cities that tend to have liberal politics, and then in my sort of class of somewhat academic uh, upper middle class uh, white people, there's just a a visceral antipathy to guns, like they might jump up and bite you. Uh, like, they, 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 like they're just kind of like an embodiment of something that's cruel and evil. And I always found that very strange growing up in a police family where there were guns around I, all I the time. I had never touched a gun until I went to the police academy. I was a, I was a gun virgin. Um, and the one thing I did learn is, yeah, guns don't shoot themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to pull the trigger. And uh, certainly in Baltimore, I mean, I felt so no so. I can. I, I felt safer having a gun than not having a gun. I mean, there's a problem where I don't want other people to have a gun because that doesn't make me safer. Right. Um, and now I live in New York City, where I'm, pe- you know, where I don't need a gun because it's a safer city, and that's a better world to be in. Yeah. Uh, but I just, you know, in ba- yeah, Baltimore's a rough town, and and uh, you said you never can get the guns out. You of, really, I mean, I'm, people who are for gun control really then should be honest and say we are trying to take away everyone's gun because that's what people believe whether it's true or not but if we don't do that it's not going to work and I don't think we can do that you said you never had to actually fire your gun but you used it on a regular basis Uh, yeah people no I mean I didn't shoot any at 
anybody or mm-hmm. shoot anybody. Uh, though I feel that was more just a matter of my short tenure there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was on the street for uh, for 14 months or so. Um, I have no doubt that if I was there longer, it's just sort of if it's a little game of roulette, uh, one day I would have needed. I mean, I people in my squad who were shot, um, you know, and people. So I mean, it, it could have been me. Uh, the, but in terms of using it, I mean, what also surprises people, I'll say it was probably out of my holster every other shift. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily pointed at anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I probably pointed it, you know, at somebody just a couple of times. But if you're going into a vacant building, uh, mm-hmm. your gun's going to be out. Yeah. Um, your gun's out. A, well, that's probably searching a vacant building was the most common reason you'd have your gun out. But uh, it was not unusual to have my gun in my hand. So let's talk a, a little bit about the... Uh, the effects of the drug war, uh, both on uh, conditions in the inner city and the incentives that creates for uh, police. I mean, how much would you say? Oh, hold, you, hold on one second. Right? I'm going to have them edit. I want to. I turned off my monitor just to satisfy us. Uh, they can edit this part. I just want to make sure it's still on and okay. it's recording, <laughs> so we don't have that problem. And it is. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so I so uh, start out by asking asking that question again. Yeah. Let, let, so let me ask you about uh, uh, the drug war and the effects that it has on that you were able to see on the inner city, but uh, more importantly, for the subject of your book on the incentives of police officers and the kind of the structure of police departments. So, uh, so I mean, how much of the work that you did every day uh, was centered around the Prohibition of drugs. Eighty percent. I mean, you can't. I mean, I'm tempted to say everything. Uh, I'm sure it's not everything. Uh, but you cannot understand policing in a high crime, high violence neighborhood in America without understanding the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is. It is virtually all drug related. Did uh, Hillary violence, Clinton start that? Light. By the way. I'm sorry? Did Hillary Clinton start that, by the way? <laughs> no, she didn't, but she wasn't no. blamed for it. Oh, she, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I always pick this, but she wasn't running for president yet. I was, was wondering, why Hillary? Of all the liberals, why <laughs> pick her? But she, um, uh, one of the reasons, by the way, is I think a, a lot of the, a lot of my cop friends who are my sort of litmus test for, mm-hmm. for Reagan Republicans uh, shouldn't be voting Republican um, because they're city employees, uh, you know, they're union members. Yeah. Um, the Democrats could get him back if um, if it's not Hillary Clinton, and if they lay off gun control. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you stress the strangely enough the environment, because a lot of these people are hunters, mm-hmm. um, they're not fans of you know super rich businessmen. Uh, so, but Hillary Clinton's not going to get any other votes. Uh, so, <laughs> I think Obama stands a, stands a better chance among among my my colleagues. Though mm-hmm. most of them still vote for McCain. Um, but that wasn't the question, that yeah. was it? <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I, that was a that was a, a, a rude interruption. But the uh, the uh, so you said like most of the work that you have to do has to do with like policing for uh, you know these guys in the corner. Like a lot of your day is just this cat and mouse game of going up to guys in the corner, watching them flee, doing yeah. it again and again. Uh, it's and and from the police standpoint, that. The, it all comes down to drug prohibition and, and, and public drug dealing. That, that's what's key. People talk about drug violence, and it's, it's a bit of a misnomer uh, because it's not... Look, if, if you say someone has... If there's alcohol-related violence, your mm-hmm. images of people getting drunk and fighting or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, drug violence is not around people taking drugs. Right. People on drugs want to enjoy their high. They're, by and large, not causing problems. Uh, drug violence is is almost exclusively drug trade violence, which unfortunately doesn't roll off the, tr- the tongue as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's violence around the trade of a prohibited product. There is, among addicts, there is a problem of drug users' crime. There's petty crime. I mean, yeah. if you're addicted to heroin, you got to get 50 bucks every day and you don't have a job and, you know, your family's not going to lend you money anymore. Uh, so, it's not that there's no crime around drug use, but the, the violence, the hardcore part of it is all around selling and it's all around public drug dealing. I mean, millions... <clears throat> Excuse me. Millions of Americans uh, buy and and smoke uh, and enjoy marijuana every day, and they're not killing each other uh, because they're buying from their family and friends and and coworkers like you're supposed to. It's when you buy from that stranger on the corner yeah. uh, that's when the violence happens because people start fighting over turf. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's unregulated. That That's the, the irony about prohibition. I mean, I, I do support drug legalization, but regulation sounds so much better. But, I mean, you can't mm-hmm. regulate something unless it's legal. Right. Uh, it's just too dangerous to, to be unregulated, or unregulated as, as it is now. But, um, I mean, it, I think... It's, it's still not on the political radar. I mean, this is a long way from medicinal marijuana. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm talking about legal crack and heroin. I mean, yeah. these are bad drugs. Uh, so I is that most of what was being uh, sold on the corners that you were policing? Yeah, Baltimore's always been a big heroin town for reasons people don't fully know. Mm-hmm. Um, San Francisco, Baltimore, part of South Boston and a rural county in New Mexico, I read in the New York Times last week. Uh, those are sort of the heroin capitals of, of America. Hmm. Uh, primarily heroin and crack, but the street corner drug dealers are also selling uh, weed. They're selling marijuana, mm-hmm. so, I mean, they're, they're going to they're gonna sell whatever people want to buy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, but primarily crack and heroin. Yeah. So and, and so most of the violence, then, most of the, the, the uh, violent crime calls that you had were related to the drug trade, uh, related to, like, turf wars? Well, most not maybe directly turf wars. Related in, in a very broad sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't day after day of one, you know, shooting up the next corner for a turf war. Yeah. Uh, though that would be part of it. Um, related in the sense people trying to rob drug dealers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you get battles that way, you know, maybe successfully, maybe unsuccessfully. Someone gets killed. Um, people selling drugs are, are often taking them themselves. Uh, so you get... I mean, there is, there, there's a cultural element, too, that um, I find especially liberals don't want to talk about. Um, there, there is some, there's, it's not that everyone's bad, but there's something bad going on there in terms of people's readiness to resort to violence to settle disputes. But I believe yeah. all that does come from the drug trade uh, in the sense that uh, it might not, it still could be a fight over some girl, but it's it comes from people who are making money through the drug trade who wouldn't be having this fight if, drugs were, were le- if there was a legal way to buy drugs. Uh, so when I say that the violence is all drug related, you, you do have to have a very broad sense of what related means. But it means that if we could regulate the selling of these dangerous things, that yeah, the violence would pretty much all stop. Yeah, so you've, uh, you uh, criticize the, uh, I, I don't know if this is related to the drug war, you'll have to tell me, uh, the the direction of policing, you say that as for, for the statistics uh, that police departments gather that arrests are what matters over time, um, but that in order to really make a dent in something like a you know a, a, an entrenched drug trade, you really have to spend a lot of time targeting the guy at the top of the food chain. Um, but the incentives for police aren't really aligned to do that, so you end up just taking these same pit- petty guys off of the street again and again, who are so easily replaced. And nothing structural really changes in the entire system. No, nothing. No, I mean that's the that's the you just summarize the basic problem. Nothing does change. But I'm even skeptical of the idea of oh, you take you go for the kingpin. Kingpins are replaceable too. Yeah. I mean, there, there's an economic structure going on here. Um, it doesn't matter who you take out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, we took out Afghanistan, and, and well, now there's more opium than ever being produced there. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter which level you take out is going to be replaced. But from from the patrol, I mean, I was a uniform patrol officer, mm-hmm. so you focus on on the corner drug dealer. I mean, I think you should because that's the neighborhood nuisance. You leave yeah. it to the narcotics squads to sort of go up the up the ladder a bit. But it's not like going up the ladder is helping things either. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's. In the police world, arrests are good. That's, I mean, sort of the first thing mm-hmm. you have to understand to, to understand what's going on. Um, there has been a shift in the past 10, 15 years since the crime drop in New, in New York to actually hold police responsible for the crime rate. That's a that's a new one, and it's great. Police mm-hmm. should be responsible for crime and you know be rewarded when it goes down and well, I don't know, sternly reprimanded when it goes up. <laughs> uh, but short of that, and crime overall isn't, well, maybe this year, the first quarter, they say crime is down, and, I, and hopefully that'll last, but uh, in general, if you go back all of three months, crime isn't going down in Baltimore, and you'll know, we'll see if the, the current drop is just a fluke or not. Um, so if crime is not going down, then police still have to show that they're working, and yeah. the primary way they do that is by locking people up. 
Um, and you're not locking up innocent people. I mean, you're locking up guilty people, but it, it's a scale of lockups that is, is, I mean, almost incomprehensible. There, Baltimore's got about 650,000 people living in mm-hmm. it, um, and there are 100,000 arrests every year. Um, wow. In, in the district I worked, uh, the population is officially about 45,000. It's probably s- smaller now, mm-hmm. but uh, in, the, in the 2000 census. 45,000 people and about 20,000 arrests every year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not quite that every other person is getting locked up because there are a lot of repeat customers. Yeah. But I think it is something like every third or every fourth person getting locked up. Yeah. It is, it is a, it, it's a scale of... of it, of incarceration that that is is really just unprecedented. And this isn't really affecting uh, all demographic categories of our society. <laughs> uh, yeah, equally, well, that's part of the problem because yeah. I mean the police answer is look, this is our job to lock up criminals. That's what we mm-hmm. do. We lock up the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a certain legitimacy to that claim, right? But it isn't ap- applied equally, and that is is one of the problems. Um, mm-hmm. It is primarily affecting young, poor, black males. Mm-hmm. Um, that is the group that is just getting decimated by our criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I think no matter what your political persuasion, and, and you know, there's a huge debate on whether that should be and how it should be, uh, if nothing else, it costs too much. Um, it is, it's, it's just, I don't want to spend my tax dollars on imprisoning all these people. Mm-hmm. So I mean, granted, at Baltimore, on the street corner level, I mean, it's not that 20,000 people aren't going to prison every year. They usually get out the next yeah. day. Um, it's just that there's that very much of a rotating uh, sort of justice, rotating door of justice at, at, the, at the bottom level. But they're still, they're building up rap sheets. They're, they're, con- they're felons many times over. And then once they do commit a more serious violent crime, um, you know, then they've got a rap sheet three pages long going back to when they were, you know, 15. So um, then they, it, it, it's, it leads to the imprisonment. Um, and the problem is, in my mind, um, that with that with that sort of racial disparity is, is is it's just these communities cannot come back if we if if we're locking up the majority of of, of young men. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's huge ramifications that just kind of you know pile on top of each other. Uh, you know, like, like you know, one is just that you basically sort of arrest the possibility of mobility for uh, sort of inner city black men generation after generation. That's part of it. But then also that affects the family structure. So there's uh, you you really dent the availability of marriageable men for women, uh, and that helps perpetuate a uh, a culture of uh, of single parenthood, which tends to have worse outcomes for the children, which tends to sort of lock them into a lower level of economic achievement over time. So the, so it's playing into this whole system of constraints that's keeping a whole segment of the population uh, sort of arrested in terms of its sort of economic and social advance. Yeah, there's a guy, um, Eric Kodora, mm-hmm. I think, believe that too. He came up with the concept, if I'm saying his name right, if I'm not, I apologize, uh, with a million dollar blocks, and he looked at neighborhoods in Brooklyn, um, and he was highlighting single blocks where we spend more than a million dollars locking people up every year for people from that block. Um, Some blocks hit $5 million. And his point, he wasn't making any judgment. He's saying, we already are spending the money. So the question we should ask, is this the best use of the money we're spending? And when you're dealing with, you know, millions of dollars per city block, um, there's got to be a better way. I mean, nothing. I would say, hey, for a million dollars, you can hire six cops and there could be a cop on Mm -hmm. 24-7. I mean, let's see, maybe that will prevent the crime. So we're worth trying for what, what would happen, Peter? That, that, so uh, if you spend a lot of your day uh, hassling guys in the corner, what, what, uh, I'm curious because I just don't know. Uh, what happens if you just don't do anything? What happens if the police just don't bother those guys? Well, does it, does it start to like, get out of control and the violence goes up uh, and that you kind of need to like, keep, I think you, you use a sort of like a, fi- a brush fire analogy. You have to keep tamping out these little brush fires or else it'll grow into a bigger conflagration or or, because what's actually accomplished well I I, you do somehow have to keep things under control um I, about the crime and sort of a theoretical level, I mean, I, I prefer to have organized crime sell drugs than, I mean, the problem is it's unorganized crime. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of drugs, so I just don't want people killing each other over it. Yeah. Um, anything that sort of keeps the violence down, I, I would be for. Um, 
it, but the reason I think that you have, and the reason, I mean, I don't believe in the war on drugs, and yet I was at ground zero fighting it, um, and I didn't have any moral problems with that, not because I'm an amoral hypocrite, but I, I, I would ask myself, if I lived here, and I had to go to work in the morning, what would I want me to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the problem is that um, drug dealers are not professional, but they're not going into the Mm -hmm. trade as if they're professional jewel thieves. I mean, they're loud, obnoxious, um, they're shouting, they're cursing, they're breaking bottles, they're getting drunk, um, and, you know, all too often, something will end up with a shooting. Yeah. Uh, If they would just shut up (laughs) and do it quietly at night, um, I mean, that's what pisses off the neighbors. Right. And the neighbors, I mean, are unfortunately sort of resigned to it. I mean, maybe not resigned, but accepting that, well, you know, the cops, they ain't doing anything, so the dealers are here, um... Yeah, my, I felt my job was just to get them to be quiet. Uh, and that might have to be by locking them up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, get them to go home. I mean, like, luckily on the midnight shift, you know, 2 a.m., you can reasonably say to someone, you know, go to sleep. I mean, it's it's a, a less reasonable request in the day. So, I mean, our job was, we felt, you know, to putting everyone to bed. And hopefully, on not all the nights, but on most nights, you know, around 2, 3, or 4 a.m., you know, things would be quiet. Um, and then... You know, we could all take a nap or something. So my my impression uh, from reading, uh, I think it was some, I think it's in, uh, you know, Levitt's work uh, about the actual compensation of of petty drug yeah, dealers. Yeah, so low. And you don't actually get paid very much. So uh, what's the appeal? Is it that the uh, alternative labor market opportunities just seem so accessible given their level of education and skill, or is it is there a certain kind of prestige that attaches to it locally? Um, the answer I like saying, it's four words, drug dealers get laid. Um, I think there is a prestige factor to it. I mean, with everything you said, that's not discount. There are, there are yeah. economic arguments being made, um, but it's cool. Um, it's a matter of respect. Uh, it's, it's a matter of that they do get laid. Um, and if you're not selling drugs, look, it's not a lot of money for most drug dealers. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, that Venkatesh uh, at Columbia got his hands on the actual financial books of a gang. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's such a coup. Um, it's not a lot of money, but there is the potential, you know, the tournament model as you rise up. Yeah. There is money in the drug trade. Yeah. Um, but it even a little money, even if it's sub-minimum wage, a little money is better than none. Right. I mean, if you're already hanging out, in, in some ways it's an easy job. You're already on the corner. You get to bullshit with your friends. Um, you can't beat the commute. <laughs> and 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 you you got some pocket change. The alternative is not becoming a high priced lawyer. The alternative is nothing. Uh, it depends a bit on on the city. I think in, in Venkatesh, when he looked at, at his mm-hmm. gang in Chicago, a lot of them did have uh, legitimate legal jobs on the side. Um, the economy's worse in Baltimore. The labor market's worse. Uh, so a lot of these 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 boys and men. Um, they're, they really are unemployable. Uh, they're not going to get a job. McDonald's doesn't want them. Yeah. Uh, they have no education to speak of. Um, they have bad attitudes. Uh, they lack mainstream social skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not really employable. They don't have an option of, of, of even getting a minimum wage job. Yeah. I mean, and then the sort of the manual labor job, the, those have left. Uh, you'll see if the, the structural changes in the economy hit Baltimore harder than a lot of cities. Mm-hmm. Um, so the alternatives, they're, they're very little. Um, so you sell drugs, get some money. I mean, the other thing is people do, people are going to survive. Um, and I think a lot of people get in, there is that idea of economic necessity, mm-hmm. uh, but there—I mean, there is a cultural part of it too, and there is the whole thug life and the gangster culture, and, mm-hmm. and that, um, you know, that's where you start getting getting the harms, the, yeah. the social harms in, in the in the community. But it strikes me that that is itself an outgrowth of the culture of prohibition. That you wouldn't get that unless you were creating these black market opportunities. Uh, Absolutely, and what, what I don't. I mean, I, what I don't understand, the problem, I think, is the is prohibitionists, um, and it's not that the war on drugs just parallels alcohol prohibition. It's a direct extension of it. It's, it's part of the, you know, the dark side of the progressive movement of, of the turn of last century, mm-hmm. um, the idea that some people know better how you should behave and shouldn't behave. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started with the first drug czar, though he wasn't called that yet, was a prohibition agent because... You know, after prohibition, alcohol prohibition ended, it wasn't like they gave up their desire to 
legislate morality, they just shifted to drugs. Um, Anslinger was a, was a prohibition agent. Hmm. So this is still the prohibition movement. Um, and I think it is rooted in a very paternalistic sense of morals. And the fact that it doesn't work is strangely unconvincing to them, and that's, that's why it's very frustrating. Um, by any standard, even the standards they give, um, prohibition isn't working. Uh, and yet, they still... They, they refuse to look at, you know, other countries like the Netherlands where things where drug policy is a lot more effective than mm-hmm. it is here. Uh, they refuse to care about overdose deaths, which are entirely preventable. Nobody wants to overdose. Um, overdoses aren't suicides. And, um, there, and there's a tremendous number of overdoses in America. That is all. And, and it's because you don't know the strength of what you're getting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're... That's exactly it. And overdoses are good for business, by the way. If you're a drug dealer, when someone overdoses, everyone wants to, to, to buy your shit because that's, that's the strong stuff. But, yeah, you don't know what you're getting. Good value for um, money, yeah. And, and, and that, to me, is such a... Morally, how can you say it's better that... Um, it's, it's on my blog, actually. I forget what it is. Something like 30,000 people died last year from an overdose. Yeah. I've got to check that again. Uh, you'd think I know because I typed it. I, it was a shockingly huge number that shocked me. There's and many the things I've willing... typed that I no longer know. <laughs> the, 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 the fact that we as a society are willing to say, oh, that's okay that so many people die, when we could, yeah. none of them should, should die. And, and, it, and they die as you know victims of the war on drugs. Uh, it's, it's a complete you know, travesty. I, mean, I don't think you're going to get a, <laughs> much, of a, much of an argument uh, for me. But you didn't feel in any way... Uh, complicit in this as a police officer locking up people for uh, a uh, a consensual activity. I mean, I remember getting in uh, a somewhat spirited, youthful uh, conversation with my father, who I think uh, you know he'd mentioned something about how uh, their budget had uh, you know was was looking quite healthy because they were able to uh, take a bunch of the property of drug dealers. Uh, and that, and yeah, in small towns, that's a real problem. Yeah, Not so in big cities. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was and it was a sort of small town thing. There's not a big budget uh, for the for the police department, but there's still like a fairly decent trade in meth and a number of other drugs in sort of Which small. Doesn't didn't exist at all in Baltimore when I was there. Yeah, um, but but he said so he made some point about about, about like uh, basically being able to auction off you know cars and stereo equipment or something like that. If I if I recall, and for some reason I was quite annoyed uh, by the fact that it, it was just part of the mundane incentives of the uh, of the police department to uh, you know impound and confiscate property. And and and, and there's these special things about the drug war. Uh, you can just t- you don't even have to you know there was there was a case about yes. this a number civil of civil forfeiture law. It's yeah, a, the it's civil a forfeiture tool. tool. Yeah, and um, we would take money occasionally that way. Uh, I never don't think I took much property, um, but you would confiscate money from drug dealers based on civil for- mm-hmm. forfeiture, and it just made it a pain for them to get it back. Yeah, um, I but I complained no, to him that, that, that like th- this is just wrong, and like you could decide not to do this, right? Like like police have discretion. There's lots of laws that yeah, are and, go and like politically, politically, I don't see drugs getting legalized anytime soon, but I. Drugs have been illegal for almost 100 years. Uh, mm-hmm. Depends on which drug. All I would really like to do is turn back the clock to 1970 before the war on drugs started. Mm-hmm. Drugs were still illegal, it just wasn't the obsession of every police department. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be an improvement. Uh, I mean, you know, back when we had one seventh of the, the prison population that we do now. I mean, so realistically, I'd just be happy if, if police stopped being obsessed by it. The, the, that money coming in is part of it. From a to support police departments and drug squad, I think you see that more in small police departments. Mm-hmm. The incentive uh, for big city departments is is overtime pay, where cops uh, get paid when they lock people up. Um, mm-hmm. It's a New York City term. It's not used in Baltimore, but uh, collars for dollars um, is, is the New York term, and, and, and police everywhere use it. Um, that is a huge incentive for police officers to make arrests. Uh, it's not... Wait, so can, can explain, explain how that works. Why do you get overtime pay if you make a lot of arrests? Well, there, there are two ways. Um, we generally in Baltimore did not uh, use it to stay on the 
if you make an arrest at the end of your shift, you got to process it. That was discouraged. I mean, unless it was a real arrest. But if it was a discretionary arrest, that was discouraged, and we, we didn't abuse overtime that way. But you make an arrest, and it goes to court. And the first time it goes to court, it's postponed because uh, the person doesn't have a lawyer. And the second time, it's postponed because the person hasn't talked to the court-appointed lawyer. Um, Baltimore is less generous than many other cities. We were guaranteed two hours uh, court time overtime pay for every appearance in court. Hmm. So the ideal lockup is one that doesn't actually come to any sort of thing approaching a trial. Uh, you simply go to court, they say uh, it's been postponed, or they say we're going to drop it. You, you punch in at 9 o'clock, you punch out at 9.01. That was the ideal lockup, and you get paid two hours. Hmm. Uh, if you do that after every shift, um, you're going to increase your paycheck by you know about a third. Um, it can be wow. substantial. So officers who want overtime pay make a lot of arrests and officers who don't don't um, but, I but didn't like going to court so yeah. I wasn't too big in that game um, but this, this gets to my, the, the point that I was just asking about a second like whether or not this rests on easily on people's consciences because when you uh, set, you know, we, you're arresting a guy uh, that goes on his record. If he gets arrested a number of times, he might have to spend some significant prison time. Prison is terrible, so you've got a a, a, a very clear financial incentive for police officers to basically ruin the lives of young black men. And no. does, does that bother I mean, anyone? Short answer is no. <laughs> uh, the longer answer is, I mean, they are criminals. Um, myself, again, I don't take the war on drugs personally. I mean, I don't yeah. believe in it, but I saw my drug enforcement as quality of life enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, me not, I mean, the drug dealers were not nice people, and me leaving them alone was not going to help the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so given what I could do as an individual police officer, um, I would, you know, make drug lockups. It wasn't my obsession like it was for some police officers, but I saw it as a quality of life issue. Uh, in terms of the overtime pay, I mean, you know, those are the rules. Uh, it's not the cops fault that the court system so screwed up. Right. Uh, that's, you know, but the cops benefit from it, and they know they get that money. Uh, it's important to point out, though, that, and this gets into the racial disparity again, it's hard to say how many people take drugs because it's illegal and people aren't likely to admit it, but ev pretty much every study shows similar illegal drug usage rates uh, between white Americans and African Americans. Uh, the type of drug taken it can vary, but the overall usage rates are pretty similar. Um, but you can only make a lot of lockups, so an unlimited number of arrests in neighborhoods that have public drug dealing and this active drug market, because um, a lot, remember, you're not just arresting the low level drug dealer, you're arresting the drug addict right. uh, for drug possession. That, in terms of a not being prosecuted is an ideal arrest, and heroin addicts are very docile, and they tend to be easy arrests, so you can wait until someone buys a pill and then lock them up for that pill if you really want. Mm -hmm. um, you can only do that where you have public drug dealing, and maybe there's uh, some, but in, maybe there's somewhere in America, you know, in some trailer park I don't know about where there's public drug dealing, but by and large, open sure. air public drug dealing is confined to minority neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, and that is the key link that links it to race. It's not that cops go out saying, I want to lock up black people. Right. Um, not by any Well, so sense. consequently, like, uh, you know, the police aren't very popular in these neighborhoods, so... Oh, like, no. Well, no, but, you know, I was surprised. Um, there is an, a strong conservative strain in, in, mm -hmm. in black America. Oh, yeah. uh, the, you know, the, the, the idea of, of pops, you know, taking off his belt to discipline his kids. Oh, yeah. um, I was surprised how... I, I would not say that police community relations are good, don't get me wrong, but there was more support than I was expecting, actually. Yeah, well, did, um, you, did you encounter the, the you know, the, 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 the stop snitching kind of culture? Like, like you if know, you talked to, if you were cooperative to police in putting I mean, somebody away? talk to police. No. I mean, that it came out of the DVD that came out of Baltimore um, uh, right about when I was there, right mm -hmm. after I left. I, you know, that's nothing new. Um, it goes back to the mob and Omar Ta and the code of silence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's any worse now than it was ten years ago. In some ways, maybe people are snitching more, which is the movement's a response to that. Um, that that might be part of it. Uh, certainly, there was an effort when I was there uh, to get low-level all drug offenders. Uh, started being questioned by detectives, so there was much more of a pressure to get people to snitch and to turn, uh, to flip on onto, onto other people. But 
leaving aside the whole sort of movement, if you want to call it that, the stop snitching concept, it was a student in my class at, at John Jay recently when we were talking about this, and he said, you know why we don't talk to cops? Because they don't do anything for us. It wasn't so much the, I mean, perhaps didn't want to be cause called a rat either, but it was simply the, the police aren't here for us. Um, the violence is still here. Uh, all they do is lock us up. All they do is hassle, mm-hmm. up, uh, hassle us. If we actually, if they were helping us, uh, maybe we'd help them. But he didn't see the police as helping him at all. And, and I mean, it's unfortunate. Uh, and it's a lot of the help police do, and maybe he doesn't see. But that philosophy, there's certainly a grain of truth to it, maybe more. Um, that's what's at the root of, of people not wanting to talk to police. And the other part, of course, is there is some danger. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not... Yeah, you know, witnesses do get hurt. Uh, yeah, and, you know, everywhere. So I mean, on the other, if people don't want to talk to me, who you know, I I didn't live in that neighborhood. I went home every night. Right. Uh, they got to stay there. So in that sense, I can't necessarily blame them. But the problem is, if people, you can't go to court unless you got a witness to testify. Uh, people literally get away with murder because no one's willing to testify. Um, our court system demands. Mm testimony. Uh, it's in the Constitution. And if you don't get that, you can't win a court case, and it's a real problem. Yeah. So you, uh, so, if, you know, I, I think you, it's pretty clear that your number one, if you were going to do something about crime in the inner city, the number one thing to do would be to legalize drugs and to regulate it. Um, but given the constraints of the drug war, uh, what do you think is the biggest reform that police departments could do to improve the quality of policing and uh, you sort of improve the, you know, lower the crime rate, improve the community's sense of security and peace of mind. Uh, is there anything that could be done that uh, police could really be doing better? Yeah, I love foot patrol. Uh, that is, I, and, and the communities love foot patrol. Everybody loves foot patrol except police departments. Um, I, I, Why don't they? Because their feet get tired? Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little deeper than that, but um, yeah, a car's more comfortable. Um, you know, you got a radio, you have a roof, uh, you've got um, air conditioning. Um, life is better in a car. Uh, that being said, I think we have to tell police officers when they come in, you know, just like the, the male delivery man or woman, you know, this job is going to be, you're going to be outside a lot. So, mm-hmm. you know, get ready for it. Um, now, what, what, now, what are the advantages of a patrol? That, that the, the, the guy in the car is just too remote to be stopping anything or is it that yeah. there's a lack of interaction between the actual people that you're policing if you're in a car you are very shielded in a car literally and figuratively I mean I always find it interesting now that the well there's a good reason because car patrol is the norm but I always find it strange the burden is on foot patrol to show that it's effective which isn't not easy to do by the way mm. uh I think the burden should be on car patrol why, why are you sitting in a car there's, that's where there's no advantage mm-hmm. um you are isolated in a car. That's part of the reason cops, myself included, like cars, is because every crazy person on the street can't come up to you and bother you. I mean, if they do, you can, you know, flick on the lights and siren and drive away. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Open port and call. Uh, you're, you're, you know, uh, if you're walking foot, you got to deal with people, unpleasant people, before they commit a crime. Once, once you're in a car, you respond to a call and you arrest them after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot tougher police work to deal with because you can't arrest them because they haven't committed a crime yet, but th- that peacekeeping idea of crime prevention, uh, you would get more in foot patrol. But but the real, if anything, I think a problem with being in a car, well, along with it doing no good, is you can't tell the difference between... Look, everyone's hanging out on their stoops in the summer uh, because backyards are unusable because of decomposing animals, smells, and trash. Um you know, every, most people don't have air conditioning, so everyone's outside. The difference between a group of friends hanging out, my, you know, minding their own business, mm-hmm. uh, maybe they got, you know, they got music and they're, you know, they're drinking malt liquor or whatever, but they're not causing trouble and they're not bad kids. The difference between them and those same kids, um, you know, harassing old people, um, you know, mm-hmm. harassing women, dealing drugs, is very s- subtle. It's obvious if you're on the street. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so obvious to know who's, you know, who, who's causing trouble and who's not. When you drive up in a car, you just don't know because it looks the same. You can't hear them. You don't have that approach on foot. Mm-hmm. You can't see their interactions with others. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you can't see how they react to you either. I mean, that, that would be probably telling, right? If, if, no, if some, nobody's doing anything wrong, the approach of the police officer is not going to 
cause any sort of like mild panic. Sometimes, not always. I mean, I mean, there, there are some bad relations, so it yeah. could be based on past experience. It could be, you know, you could just hate the cops. Right. Um, so, but yeah, the, but you you're, you are right. I mean, you you see how they would respond. You go up to people. I mean, because remember, even where it works, you would. I mean, the drug dealing is a problem, but you'd also get old ladies who think that every you know every fifteen year old sitting on the corner is dealing drugs, which isn't the case. Um, how about so, bikes? You, know, you like bikes? Uh, I, I think bikes are the perfect sort of comp. I just happen to like bikes in general, so I, I am biased towards that. I mean, I, you know, I freak that I ride my bike to work. Uh, but from policing, from a policing standpoint, like you know, you can't force everyone to bike because some, right. you know, you don't want the cops to fall off. Um, but I think it's the perfect compromise between uh, speed and stealth. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can get places quickly. Um, you can actually bike away from you know someone who. You, you don't want to deal with, uh, and yet um, one of the reasons I like to ride a bike myself is that uh, I feel more confident of the ability to run away from a cop on a bike than I do in I a know. car. Yeah, well, but I mean, mm-hmm. people who ride bikes know what a wonderful way they are to get around. Yeah, um, and in the city, I think they're just, you know in the city when there's traffic, they're they're usually faster than cars because um, you can break all the laws. Yes. Well, because as a cop, you can go through lights. Anyway, but you still have traffic. You can get around on yeah. a bike that you, that you can't in a car. Um, I think that the, the bike sh- has to be used more. The, but, you know, but that, that's... you got American culture is not too pro-bike. So mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be happy if more cops were walking the beat. The problem, along with it being tougher work, though, is in the police department. And this is a structural change mm-hmm. that would be major, but, but it could be done if commissioner wanted to. Um, foot patrol is punishment. Mm-hmm. And so I... I like walking foot primarily, um, well, we'd do it as exercise. Uh, ideally, when people were asleep at 4 a.m., we had a little route that was a, you know, we'd walk around this set of blocks each each four times. It was a mile each. So we'd walk four miles uh, in an hour, and uh, that was our, our exercise. Now, we, we kind of did it, had timed it because we wanted to walk, so that there weren't a lot of people out. Yet, I learned more on those walks about what was going on than I did, you know, the rest of the night in the car. And, mm-hmm. and you know, our, our motivations for doing foot patrol were sort of selfish and, and related more to burning off all the beer we were drinking after work. But people would see us, you know, in the middle of the winter, these two cops walking around on foot patrol, and they loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if people want foot patrol, why not give it to them? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, and the, the, the guy might be going by as you're coming out to, you know, do something, and you can have a little conversation and... Just yeah, like you can't you can't approach someone in a car in the middle of a parking lot. That can and you also you get to know businesses better. Mm-hmm. Um, but pe- you are more approachable, and, and ultimately people crimes get solved because people snitch, and and that's more, people are more likely to snitch to a cop they recognize and they have some dealings with. Mm-hmm. But as long as foot patrol is punishment, um, even I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to think people you know people would think I'm being punished, and right. it was less pleasant. Uh, you know, there are advantages to being in a car for comfort. Um, that has to get turned around in the police department. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to stop using foot patrol as punishment. Maybe they need to make the seats in the cars more uncomfortable. Well, Put a little spike I, I would never rec- for, for, for my fellow officers, I would never recommend that. Um, <laughs> and I, I have sympathy for New York officers who have cage cars and they can't even move their seat back. Uh, uh, there, there's a way they could do it, though, um, which is, well, there's one simple way. The money, how about this is the easiest. The money you don't burn in gas will give to you. So oh. if you get 20, 30 bucks a shift, a lot of cops are going to start walking foot. Uh, That's a great idea. It de- would cost the police department nothing. Um, even if you want to walk foot, though, now, because you're so tied to, to answering radio calls, you can't go far from your car mm-hmm. because you're expected to be available. And so that's a bit of a problem. Um, but what I would do is once cops get out of the academy, I would give them cars so they learn the streets and don't get lost and can mm-hmm. back up other officers. I think you do need cars for that. Sure, sure. Sure. Um, and then after well, you know, a couple months, a year, whatever it is, you promote officers to foot patrol. Give them uh, maybe a you know special title. Uh, ideally, you'd pay them more. Uh-huh. Uh, but that would change the culture and uh-huh. say, yes, it's tougher work, and we're going to pay you more, and you're more experienced. Um, uh-huh. As it is now. When and it'll pay dividends oh, in health. I, I think so. Well, why not at least try it? Yeah. You know, let's try it somewhere. I think it would work. Um, I, I might be wrong, but... Every single department pretty much does it the same way, and, and it's not good enough to put to, to, to have car patrol. Um, and it's expensive. Originally, which is a 
curious little footnote in history. The purpose of car patrol was, there were two purposes. One was it was going to eliminate crime, mm-hmm. um, which it didn't do. And the other was it was going to save money, which it didn't do. Hmm. So given the fact that it was 0 for 2, like you think they would have gotten rid of it. But no, um, it it doesn't impact crime, and, and it costs a lot of money to keep those cars, that money that could be going to police officers. Um, and that's, but it, but it, it would be a major change in culture. Having just one or two officers walk foot is not good enough. It, I mean, you really have to change the change the, the the cops on foot have to answer calls, and if it takes five minutes longer to get there, so what? Yeah, it, that's not a big deal. Um, but but it's not just having you know one or two officers on foot and leaving everything else the same. That that wouldn't be good enough. Well, Peter, I think our, our time is up, so we'll have to leave it there. Uh, so end the drug war, put cops on feet, uh, and uh, read uh, Peter's uh, fascinating book, Cop in the Hood, oh. My Year Policing uh, Baltimore's Eastern District. Uh, Peter Moscos, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's been fun. That went, that went fast. <laughs> it is. It goes faster than you think it will, doesn't it? <laughs> I know. All right, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. All right.